After her teen son died, Elizabeth Mitchell learned something valuable. To use that black cloud that moved in, that depression or anxiety or fear, rather than recoil from it, to see it as a prompt to pray and worship, almost as if it's an alarm clock. I'm low, I'm discouraged, I'm fearful. Now is a perfect time to worship. You're listening to the Revive Our Hearts podcast for January 16th, 2024. I'm Dana Gresh. Our host is Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. The death of a child brings a unique kind of pain. I watched my mother go through that many years ago as my 22-year-old brother was killed in a car wreck. There's nothing like that kind of pain. It's something no parent ever wants to go through. But in our fallen world, many do. Maybe you've experienced it, or you know someone who's gone through it. If so, you know the agony, the profound sadness, even at times perhaps questioning the goodness of God. Well, yesterday on Revive Our Hearts, Elizabeth Mitchell shared some of those emotions that she felt when her son James died at the age of 13. If you missed it, I want to encourage you to listen to yesterday's program on the Revive Our Hearts app or at reviveourhearts.com. I think it'll touch you deeply. Elizabeth is back with us today to help us learn the art of grieving well. Here's my co-host, Dana Gresh, talking to Elizabeth Mitchell. Elizabeth, if someone were sitting here that's walking through the same kind of grief that you have had to endure, what would be the first piece of comfort or advice that you would give to her? I would tell her that she doesn't need to understand or have answers to her questions, that the best thing to do, even with her questions, is to turn her face in God's direction and cry out to Him and ask Him to carry her through or carry him through and to just envelop her in the knowledge that he is there, he is not indifferent to her pain. Uh, Psalm 27, familiar scripture, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He, He is sufficient. He is capable, and I can speak my fears to him, even if I can't do it with others. So let Jesus in and let his word in. I I can't stress enough to other people, even portions of the scripture you might not understand. As you read his word, it is a bomb. It is strength. It is oxygen, as I mentioned yesterday. Mm. It is it is, he is the bread of life. He is living water. He has not abandoned you any more than a loving parent abandons any child that they love. You move towards a child when they're hurting. Mm-hmm. And Satan loves for us to feel as if we are abandoned when we are in great challenges. He loves to make us feel separated from our Heavenly Father, and that is a lie. Our Father in Heaven is perfect, and when His children are hurting— He is never closer or more present in their life. The same way as a loving, any loving parent knows to turn towards their child, our father turns to us. I'm listening to you say that and thinking, I just can't help but think that someone is listening and saying, I don't believe you. I'm mad at God. I don't know if he's there. I'm mad at the words of scripture. Why would a good God take my child, take my marriage, take my my life purpose, my life path? Why mm-hmm. would a good God allow me to have a parent who has abandoned me? How can I understand a God who doesn't abandon when I have one, a parent that has? What do we do with those questions, those... Heavy questions. Mm-hmm. You ask them, but don't put your back to your only source of help. You ask this God that you're doubting or this God that you think has done something terrible, but you keep asking him to show himself. 
or ask him to give you the faith to even believe that he is there or to send somebody into your life that knows your situation and can give you some guidance that you need at the moment. Ask him the hard questions, knowing you're not going to maybe get an answer that you like. Without faith, he says, it's impossible to please me. We want to walk by sight, and that only happens in eternity. We have to walk by faith. I have to believe that this God, whom I might just be getting to know, or this God I have no idea who he is, nothing else is working in your life, my dear friend who's hurting. All your other avenues have been closed to you. You haven't gotten comfort from the alcohol or your indifference. Your anger hasn't brought you any sense of relief. Your your bitterness, has it? what has it given you? So if these are coming up blank, would you just trust somebody who's a little further down the road from you, who understands what you're going through? Would you trust that? I'm not making this up, that if I tell you he is trustworthy, I'm telling you from a place where there was nothing to trust and he showed up. And I, mm. I want that for you too. That yeah. it's okay that you doubt. It's okay that you're angry. He can handle all of it. But don't cut off really your only source of hope and help. Did you ever feel tempted to do that yourself? Or were there moments of doubt? Mm -hmm. When they told me he needed a heart transplant, I was uh, quite angry with God. I thought at four and a half, after all that he's asked us to endure, and now this dead end, how, how could God betray us in this way and ask us to now deal with a heart transplant and all the repercussions and the consequences and the management of that? I remember... Uh, not wanting any part of that and um, feeling incredibly angry. Yes, that mm. that was a tough time. Well, you've made it through. So how did you make it through that specific thing? I cried a lot and I uh, I nursed my anger for a little and and I asked him to help me. I, I said, you, you have to help me. Mm -hmm. And um, he sent people to talked to me about transplants and showed me pictures of their children who had endured and come out on the other side. And he comforted me in different ways, mm -hmm. but used people. He used people that knew how broken I was, and they helped to patch me up and, mm. and remind me that I had forgotten about his grace and that his mercy. Yeah. I had forgotten all the things I told them. Now I had to put it into practice as it's, well. I think it's easy to get spiritual amnesia at times of difficulty. Yeah. But you obviously have remembered because you've written down the lessons you've learned in your book, Journey for the Heart, Hope When Life's Unfair. Now there's not probably in this book a three-step plan to recovering mm -hmm. your heart or finding joy because it just doesn't work that way. Our paths are as different as each of us are as individuals, but... Take us into some of the lessons that you learned in your story that you write about in that book. What's one of them? That when you wake up in the morning and you think, I can't face today, that to remind, I had to remind myself, there is enough new grace and new mercy for today. I didn't use it all up. Hmm. I remember specifically at Miami Children's feeling I, that I couldn't get off that little parent cot they had provided for us across the hall. And I said to him, I need mercy. I, I am just at the end. And I walk into James's cubicle and the little nurse's aide said, hi, Mrs. Mitchell. I'm here to help you today with James. And my name is Mercy. Mm. And I just thought he sent me a postcard to remind me, yeah, it's all right. And I am here. Wow. So enough grace and mercy and that and that you that you can't control anything yeah that all of life is an incredible gift but you have no control and it's control is an illusion someone has said mm. and to recognize that 
my calling today is to just do the next. Elizabeth Elliot would say, you do the next thing. Mm-hmm. Someone said, you do the next right thing. Right. You can't, you, you can't conquer the world at the moment you're grieving or you're confused or you're disappointed. But you can get out of bed and brush your teeth and comb your hair and go make breakfast for the children mm. and turn on the computer and do your one assignment or you do the next right thing. You don't have to have the end. You don't have to, no one can solve your problems and you least of all. But one step at a time, it's so trite, but it's true. Keep doing the next right thing. How do you want to do that? Do you just tell yourself, I just got to do the next thing? I mean, I remember going through trauma and I didn't eat for three days. And it honestly wasn't because I was choosing not to eat. I forgot. I just didn't remember. My mom came on the third day and said, have you eaten? Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, I haven't. Mm -hmm. I haven't eaten. My husband was sitting in a trauma ICU, and I wasn't sure how that story was going to end. It thankfully ended well, but for those three days, I didn't think. So how do you want to do the next right thing, like feed yourself or brush your teeth? Mm Mm-hmm. I think when the sun is shining, you have developed spiritual habits. You learn about worship and prayer, reading his word, fasting, journaling, um, quiet, solitude. You learn that when things are going all right. You put them into practice like an athlete prepares for a race. You know, mm-hmm. he doesn't just show up for a marathon and run it. He's right. preparing. And life is hard, and life is messy, and you cannot coast through life, no matter how long you've walked with the Lord. It's not a coasting. So you prepare for what's going to come by having, I think, spiritual habits in place so that when the shoe drops and when that calamity befalls you, Mm -hmm. there is something there to draw from. That's one way. And you have, have a tribe. Have a group that you have fun with, that you love, that you laugh with, (laughs) but that have your back. So when you can't pray and when you can't read a verse and when you don't want to hear a verse and when you can't deal with life, you text a friend, help, pray for me. I'm going under, whatever it is that you need to say. So develop those friends when the sun is shining. So in the storm and the rain and the upheaval. You have them to draw from. You're not just depending on yourself. Yeah, and my experience has been that you develop those relationships and you find out which are the the solid Mm -hmm. ones, which are rooted in the rock of Jesus Christ when you become a hard project, when you become difficult, when you become a lot of work. Because you probably had friends that sacrificed a lot to walk your, your other children through yeah, schooling and things like that while you were in the hospital with James mm-hmm. and to walk you through grief. Do you find that some people get overwhelmed by how much of a burden they are and so they just stop asking for help when they really need to be asking for help? Yes, that, that can be the case. Absolutely. What would you say to the woman that's struggling with that feeling? Let people help you. <laughs> And as you get well, then you will know how to help other people. Beautiful. So receive it now, even though it's awkward, even though you don't want to ask, with a mindset, as I get better, as I get stronger, as I heal, then it will be my turn to help somebody else. Mm. So it's not a one-way street. It's a beautiful, beautiful two-way relationship with other people. Pay it forward. Yes. Yes. Yesterday, you shared a scripture that was very meaningful to you in those early days when James was a baby. Fast forward to when he was 13 and he went to be with the Lord. Were there any scriptures that came to life for you in a unique way at that stage? Uh, Psalm 105, uh, he gave me as like a prescription Hmm. at a, a very difficult time. And I wrote it almost like a doctor would write out. This is a prescription for you. It's 
Psalm 105, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually and remember the wondrous works that he has done. So he gave me this, and then it became a blueprint of how I could, the next right thing I was supposed to do. And one that percolated to the top, I learned somewhere along from some book or some speaker, and I wish I knew to give them credit, but it was to worship, most especially when you don't feel like it, worship in the dark, to use that black cloud that moved in, that depression or anxiety or fear, rather than recoil from it, to see it as a prompt to pray and worship, almost mm. as if it's an alarm clock. I'm low, I'm discouraged, I'm fearful. Now is a perfect time to worship and not be fake in that worship, worshiping his goodness, his character, his presence, not asking for answers or figuring anything out, but and not being especially joyful for the circumstances you are in, that's not a part of it. It's worshiping the God who is in control. Mm. Wow. That's beautiful. I love how you talk about that anxiety and that depression when it shows up, letting it be an alarm clock, mm -hmm. an invitation to worship. Psalm 105 says, remember the wondrous works that he has done. How has that fit into the blueprint of walking through this? Uh, some days in the hospital when I was very discouraged, I always had my Bible and my journal. So when James was sleeping and nobody was visiting, um, I'd have the TV off. So I'd have a little quiet in that room. And I would some days just make a list of every tiny little thing to be thankful for. Hmm. You know, if James swallowed more today than he did yesterday, or he was able to, you know, after he had a stroke after the second open heart surgery. So mm. what little activity could he do today that he couldn't do tomorrow? You know, who came to visit? I just I made a list of things to be thankful for when I didn't feel particularly thankful. Mm. I found that helpful. And Remembering the wondrous things he has done, I think that's why I wrote the book. It's why I blog. That's why I teach and encourage other people from remembering the wonders that he has done. It, it's an act of obedience to remember. Oh, you, you carried me through that. That means I can trust you to carry me or somebody I love through what they're going through. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important for us to remember. It's, it's like bringing long-term memory into short-term memory and causing the focus to be on the God who, yes, yes, I can trust him because of what he did in my past. Wow. R verse 4 says, seek the Lord with his strength. Seek his presence continually. How did that work for you? It's, it's going to his word and just for me, hanging on to one verse not thinking I need to read chapters and chapters mm -hmm. or read the Bible in a year, as wonderful as those plans are. But seeking his presence is being quiet, finding a regular time, mm -hmm. and just reading scripture and then praying it back to him is a way of practicing his presence. It's a two-way conversation. You read his word and that's God talking to you. And as you read his word back to him or pray his word back to him. That's us talking to him, using his own words, praying it not just for ourselves, but praying it for the people that we love and care about. Mm. I love that you say some days just one verse, because when you're walking through grief, your brain does not work in the same magnificent way right. that it does at right. other times in your life. And creating the expectation to experience God's Word in the same way as you would when your brain is functioning at optimum health isn't fair, and it can just create a lot of discouragement. There have been times in my life where I just wrote a verse, one verse, 
on an index card, carried it around with me because if I didn't carry it with me, I wouldn't remember what I read that morning. Sure. So what a grace to just offer that invitation. Psalm 105 says, O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Do you feel like one of his chosen ones? Do you feel chosen by God, even through all that you've walked through? I do. I, he chose us, and he continues to choose us to do his work, to minister, minister to our own children and grandchildren, minister to one another as a couple, minister to people who live close by and people who are far away across the world. The things that we get to do, it's a privilege to serve him, to get to know him. It's a privilege to seek his presence continually. I love the fact that scripture like Psalm 139 says that when I sit down and when I rise up, he's there. You know, we do so many things sitting down. Mm -hmm. We have meetings. We have quiet time. We sit at the table with our family and in all those regular, ordinary places. The Lord is there with us as we're sitting down, dealing with difficult things, rising up and flourishing. In that psalm, it says that the darkness isn't dark to him. What we see as darkness, what we are afraid of, to him it's light. He sees through it. He sees around it. We see a tiny little sketch. We see a tiny photograph, and he sees a full-length video of where this is going, what I will do with it, who I will, uh, how I will transform your heart and mind and then use you to minister to other people. Beautiful. Elizabeth Mitchell will be right back to pray. Her book is Journey for the Heart, Hope When Life's Unfair. It's not available from Amazon, but you can get it directly from Elizabeth. There's a link to how you can order Journey for the Heart in the transcript of this program at reviveourhearts.com. And while you're there, have you seen all that reviveourhearts.com has to offer for free? It's the giving of friends like you that make it possible for us to offer a growing library of absolutely free resources. These include audio and video content, articles and blog posts, event kits, free downloads, and much more. And it's available all year long. When you support Revive Our Hearts with a gift this month, you're making it possible for us to continue offering dynamic, trustworthy, free, helpful, biblical content. If you'd like to be a part, you can make a donation at reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. Again, that's 1-800-569-5959. Thank you so much for your partnership and for supporting this ministry as together we call women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. Well, tomorrow on Revive Our Hearts, we'll hear an encouraging message from Elizabeth Mitchell. She'll show you that God can use you even though you don't have everything all together. And that's a message all of us need. When your situation is less than perfect, maybe especially when our situation is less than perfect, God excels in glorifying himself through our weakness. You won't want to miss it. Now, here are Dana and Elizabeth again to close our time today. I wonder if for those women who aren't there yet and they're just feeling weak and wondering how can I pull myself out of this chair to brush my teeth or take a shower, would you pray over her? Oh, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you because of Jesus Christ and all that he has done for all of us. And today, Dana and I come before you on behalf of uh, women listening, women whose hearts have been broken over some injustice or some great disappointment or some great grief. And we cry out on their behalf and just ask that the power of your Holy Spirit would work in their life, that you would bring them hope 
that you remind them to have courage not in where they are but in who you are that you would bring loving people to them to help them that you would give them the grace to accept the help bless these women wherever they are whatever they're dealing with father thank you that we don't need to tell you their story that you know all about them and the details in their broken heart and we commit these women to you and all the other listeners father who need to share all of this and more with those in their life bless and encourage and continue to use this great ministry to touch the hearts of hundreds and hundreds of those around the world i pray in jesus name amen amen This program is a listener-supported production of Revive Our Hearts Ministries, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.